Hello and welcome to another Folk Talk Live lecture. My name is Tom Bestford. I'm the Chief Executive of English Folk Expo uh, and I'm delighted today to be, uh, present, uh, to be uh, welcoming Phil and Hannah to talk to us a little bit about self-releasing an album. But before we do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so uh, the lecture is being recorded and will be available to watch by anyone again on folktalkacademy.com, totally free. So please do uh, tell your friends and share that around. There's a range of around 50 or so lectures, plus a whole, a whole host of other bits of helpful information and talks and conferences available on that website for anybody. Um, today's lecture will have closed captions available. So if you just click the CC button on your screen, you should be able to see that uh, right away. And there's also a link to, which I'll post in the chat, to a page of fully adjustable captions. There'll be time at the end for a bit of a Q&A. So please do use the Q&A box as well if you want to ask any questions. Uh, and beyond that, I think that's everything I, I, I need to mention. Uh, so uh, Phil, uh, Phil, Hannah, if you'd like to turn on your camera and mic. Hello, lovely to see you. Hi. Hi. I'll hand over to the two of you. Off you go. Thank you. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us and um, it's lovely to be here. Thanks to Folk Talk Academy for inviting us to do this talk. It's on self-releasing albums. So we are a duo, folk duo, Edge Larks, and um, we have self-released nine albums since 2010. And I'm just going to share our screen. Here we go. Yeah, so there's some of the albums that we've made together. Um, so just a caveat before we start properly, um, we're going to talk about the way that we've done it. It's not an official method um, and uh, we are constantly refining the process. We've made plenty of mistakes along the way. Those mistakes have generally helped us to learn how to uh, self-release our albums better. I think we've managed to keep improving, um, but it is a continual learning curve. So um, this is not... Um, sort of an official method it's a kind of a, a quick overview of how we do it because there's a heck of a lot to cover so we're going to kind of speed through it's a massive subject yeah and the industry is constantly changing and has changed dramatically in the last 10 years since we started doing this and the biggest change of all is the move away from physical product towards streaming of music uh, and our business model was built around um, the physical model really we've We've made our living selling CDs. So we're going to focus on that because luckily in the folk genre, uh, there's still a demand for physical product. Um, but we are going to mention streaming as well as we go along. So first of all, why would you want to self-release? Um, well, we think there are multiple reasons why it's actually a, a really good way to get your music out there. Firstly, um, it's a way to get your music heard by people without waiting for a record deal. And if you are just starting out, it might actually be um, your only way, uh, your only option. Um, uh, it seems that um, deals with record labels, especially as sort of belts tighten in the music industry, aren't necessarily so readily available if you can't prove your selling power that you have a bit of a fan base already. So self-releasing can help you gather some momentum, um, which um, might even make then getting a record deal more likely. Yeah, a couple of successful self-releases would certainly give you a better pitch if you were to speak to a label later on, so if that's, what, if that's the way you want to go. Um, also, you'll have greater artistic control down this route. You'll be the project manager, you'll be doing, you're the musician, you're everything really, you're wearing all the hats. So um, if you're a control freak like me, you'll, you'll prefer this way. <laughs> Um, but the most important thing, really, is that it could potentially be more profitable, so potentially a more viable way of making a living within this genre. Yeah, um, so um, we have been lucky enough to have been approached by a couple of labels over the years about um, doing some kind of deal with them, um, and um, we were very honoured to be approached, it's, it's a lovely thing, um, but in the end, we actually decided that it wasn't for us. Um, so we were very excited and then we sort of got down to the nitty gritty and did the maths. Um, it was one particular deal, um, a really lovely record label who we would love to work with. Um, but the problem was uh, we were already making our living full time musicians at, at this point um, from gigging and from CDs, CDs being quite a large part of our income. And what had happened was we'd um, 
we'd actually already paid to record the album, so we'd put a lot of money into the studio process, um, and the label wanted to license that album, so they were proposing that they would do the sort of label services that we'll talk about later, um, so they were going to put their money in. But we'd already put our money in, and under their deal, our, our money that we put in wouldn't have been recoupable, but theirs would have been. Um, and we, we worked it out, and we would have had to sell nearly a thousand more CDs than we would usually expect to sell in a year, in that first year of the record, uh, before we would even have recouped the costs that the label put in. So we weren't really sure that was going to happen. Even if we'd managed to sell that many more CDs than we would usually sell, we would then be on a 50-50 profit split deal. So uh, in the end, unfortunately, we decided that it, it just wasn't a financially viable option for us. Um, and of course, we would have been buying our own CDs off the label and uh, the cost of that would have been five times the cost of um, what it actually cost us to print them ourselves. So we kind of have settled for this um, more sustainable business model, which is a kind of director fan model where we produce the records ourselves. We have our own kind of uh, record label name that we do that under. Um, and um, it, it's kind of... Uh, uh, building a, a community around our music so we can recognize that the, the mainstream path uh, wasn't really something that our, our kind of niche genre of music was uh, particularly uh, going to be open to um, so instead um, we've uh, we've got this community around our music so it's less people but they're really dedicated and uh, it works really well for us and if you think about it you actually you only need maybe a thousand fans who are willing to pay around 30 pounds a year to you so that might just be a gig ticket and a cd that's it um and and suddenly you're making a, a quite a reasonable living so um that's where we stand on why you would self-release let's talk about how you would go about doing it so um timing is really important when you're planning an album project there's a hell, it's a big project there's a hell of a lot of things that you need to get lined up and kind of all your ducks in a row kind of scenario and if you don't get the timing quite right you might end up in a situation where you're doing the launch tour or the launch gig with no cds to sell i've done that i've done that one <laughs> or you might find that the reviews are coming out three to six months after the release date and that kind of thing which is unideal so the best way to do it is to kind of set the release date it could be a, a kind of approximation at first um and then work back from that um so if you look at the chart that we've put up there the first thing you need to do if you jump to the bottom of the chart when the pressure's not on full black it's in kind of light yellow there it gets more pressurized as you go up into the dark red you 12 months to two years before you need to start talking to your booking agent about blocking out a launch tour um in this genre it tends to be uh, kind of a two-year lead on on gig booking anyway so don't hang around with that you want to get that time blocked out and then you've got something to aim for and you've got a deadline then as well which is going to help you finish the album um they'll never get finished without a deadline you'll be writing the album for 10 years it'll be your <laughs> magnum opus well it does seem a bit counterintuitive to um to book in a launch tour and even a launch gig um before you've even written anything but that's the kind of cycle we've ended up working on that kind of like a two-year turnaround so once we've made an album we'll take a couple of months off and then start gathering ideas start writing but we'll be able to say to our booking agents you know that that tour in 18 months time that's going to be a launch tour and we want to hit this venue in that one and yeah. you know so um you do need to do it that far out although mm -hmm. interestingly covid has um enforced a bit more spontaneity on the events industry and i sort of wonder if that might um, stick around a little bit more because it is hard working so far in advance uh, before yeah. you really know what you're going to be doing. It can be. And not to lay the point too much, but just to say another point about um, uh, launch tours um, and being a bit tactical about when you plan to release your album. So you're setting this date um, before you've really got anything else to go on. Um, spring and autumn tend to be the, the times uh, that people release albums, especially the autumn. And the advantage of that is people tend to go away in the summer and then in the winter are reluctant to come out when the weather's rubbish or they're busy with Christmas or they're broke in January, all those things. So the autumn especially, but also the spring, are good times to release an album. But the flip side of that is that that's when everyone does it. So if you pick the wrong week, and I think it does tend to be a week around the beginning of October. Mm. <laughs> uh, Everybody's trying to get the same Guardian review yeah. at the same time and they can only really pick one these days. Yeah. 
coverage has been vastly reduced. Yeah, so that's, you know. Things to think about, to think but about. Um, yeah, I quite liked releasing in the spring last time, actually, that was good. Mm. Um, oh yeah, you might want to think about booking your studio time if you're going to do that as well, right at the start here, because there might be a waiting list or just finding the right dates it might take a bit of jiggling. Okay, so then you want to start writing. Well, hopefully you've started writing some songs, or you want to start making demos. You might you might still be in the writing process. That's fine. You just want to get the musical ball rolling. Start making music. Yeah. Demos sometimes they start just as a phone recording, then they make their way into the home studio. And this, you know, it kind of how, however you do your process, get the process going. Yes, the time scale we've written here isn't isn't um, a strict time scale because it really is impossible to say uh, how fast or exactly when you will write and record. But um, it does get more specific the closer you get to the release date. Um, mm. But so another thing that's really important to start on really early on, which seems sort of a bit counterintuitive once again, is to think about your visuals um, and, and really your branding. So um, I think we both feel that an album isn't just a random collection of songs with everything we've made we've wanted there to be some kind of overarching theme um a kind of a story that you're trying to tell uh so i think early mm -hmm. on if you can if you can get some photographs taking good photos um, and maybe start working with a graphic designer to kind of bring all that in so the music really sits well with the visual elements the sleeve the publicity materials that you're going to be creating you can get that sorted um, right at the start of the process, your life's going to be a lot easier because it always creeps us up on us, doesn't it? And uh, it does. <laughs> ends up being the thing that takes more time than you think. Yeah, so um, you want to get recording as soon as you can. You might be recording as you go along, or you might have a be building towards a, a two week period in studio or whatever. Um, this is not a lecture about how to make an album, so I won't go into too much detail here. But an important point to make is if you are aiming towards studio time, you're going to have to be as prepared as you possibly can be. Um, <clears throat> a lot, most of us in this genre are not don't have the luxury to hire out a really nice studio for a couple of months and go and stay there and create the album in the studio. You kind of more realistically, you want to kind of know what you're going to be doing before you get there. So using uh, home demos, um, and for us, often the demos make it all the way into the studio because the demo becomes um, a more polished demo and there's things about it that we don't want to lose. So eventually we take that demo into the studio and that becomes the final track. Even quite a lot of the elements that were recorded at home end up in the final version. Um, but we kind of, yeah, we're looking for a certain rawness maybe when we do that. Yeah. Um, and the mixing as well can take a lot longer than you think and it's a very important part of the process and it doesn't want to be squeezed time-wise and rushed uh, and there could potentially be quite a bit of to-in and fro -in between you and an engineer or between yourself and your bandmates deciding on the mixes so don't let it be squeezed give it the time that it deserves yeah and another point about the recording process is um when you're in the studio try and think ahead so if this is a frustrating thing that tends to irritate people I know and including us uh, when you're in the studio you just want to think about the music and make that as good as you possibly can and of course you do but try and think ahead document the process take some loads of photos take little video clips maybe uh, maybe you'll do like a little um, tour around um, to show people where you were recording or you'll do a bit of talking about the songs or a live uh, version of one of the songs if you can get any alternative mixes or outtakes any any extra content material really if you can produce that while you're making it and then don't just splurge it on social media straight away save it up that's your kind of bank of ammunition for later on in the process when um, when you come to to do your publicity campaign for the album to try and tell people what you've been making yeah so then you're going to master it okay yeah, mastering it's an important part um there's the musical side where basically you get another set of ears to help you kind of listen to the mixes and, and maybe put that extra shine on it. We don't need to talk too much about that now, but the, um, the thing you need to know about the mastering is you're going to need your ISRC codes um, to give the engineer. And um, what you get back from the mastering engineer is your finished product that you then need to send to the pressing house. And these days it usually comes in a DDP file um, and that contains all the metadata and all the kind of track info, the track lengths, gaps between the songs, uh, the codes, 
um, credits, the whole lot is contained within that file. So you just need to send that file then to the pressing house. So very important that you get good mastering engineer to create your good DDP file. And at, at the same time as uh, finishing off the music in this way, you really want to be finalising your artwork as well. Um, as I said, this is something that seems to always hold us up. Um, so the sooner you can get that done, I know you may feel that you can't finish your sleeve notes or your track orders uh, very far in advance of finishing the music, but there are ways and ways around that. Phil tends to, um, the demos come in useful again. You can put yes. them in different playlist orders on your phone. And Start thinking about the track order as early as you can, really, yeah. because it will hold up the graphic design yeah so yeah exactly. Play, make i usually make multiple playlists um and keep demoing them to myself eventually come up with the track order that's the, the one that we want yeah so that it's never a, a last minute decision should we put that somewhere on no it's it's very carefully considered Be ready. and and <laughs> um the other thing about getting your graphic design done early it's not just get it finished and it's done um you really want to get it finished in order to have time to to get someone to proofread it because when you've put so much effort in and then you get them back from the printers and you see a typo, that's a nightmare. So try and avoid that. Give yourself time to get it proofread by some good literate friends. Um, it's graphic design that's um, thrown us off our timing schedule in the past more than anything else, actually. Mm. It's that proofs going back and forth thing that can really just eat a few weeks away before you know it. So yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing to check, so the timings are getting a bit more specific now on our, on our graph changing. here. <laughs> so you're heading towards the release date and um, obviously you need to get physical product press, whether that's CDs or vinyl. Um, but for us, we've got most experiences with CDs, so we're talking about that. Um, it generally seems to take about a month, but check with your printers in advance. They should be able to tell you how long it's going to take and you can factor that in uh, with your timings. Um, and then, of course, as soon as you've got your copies of your album you need to send copies to your publicist if you're not working with the publicist you can be sending them out yourself but um, the timing on that quite specifically needs to be about three months in advance of your release date and uh, that's because a, a publicist will want that for for long lead publications um maybe magazines that are only published uh, every couple of months or um if you need to get if you're really hoping to get a coveted spot on the on the radio program or something um, it, there's, there's quite a lot of planning that goes in with that so you need to be on top of that well in advance you also should set up your pre-orders and pre-saves and start kind of trying to create a bit of momentum behind what you're doing and then by that final month you should be in full full flood with it all um, your publicity build-up should be happening your social media campaigns should really kick in then full full strength um, and here I have put digital distribution upload and check I would say this is the latest possible date for you to do that, a month before. Um, but if you are making CDs as well, then you will have had the, the finished files uh, for, for quite some time. So if you can possibly do that sooner, basically the more time you can buy yourself to update every um, digital platform and get it all looking really good, um, the better. So um, that's the that last ditch timing for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about budget. Yeah, it's an expensive business making an album and uh, when you're self-releasing you have to come up with the money yourself. No one else is going to give it to you. So um, here's a kind of rough idea of what you might need to spend um, kind of based on not our last album, the one before. Uh, recording costs is going to be one of your biggest um, expenses if you choose to record in a professional studio. You may uh, record completely at home which is what we did with our last album, and that will massively reduce the costs. But does it reduce the quality of the product? That remains to be seen. Um, but studio costs are approximately £300 a day, and we try and cap it at two weeks um, of that. So you've got you know, 4200 on recording there. The mastering is going to be more on top of that. Um, and that can really vary, and I think an important part can. Of, of this process is going for the most expensive option actually isn't isn't necessarily the best route is it so. mm, choose wisely you, you don't need a famous mastering engineer that's going to charge you through the nose um just to have him in the credits because no one really is going to pay that much attention to that so choose someone whose ears you trust who's going to give you a professional product who's not going to as my dad would put it pull your pants down <laughs> um financially and and someone who's genre appropriate as well because mm. Um, 
that's going to really affect it you know if they're used to to mastering heavy metal bands then you might end up with something quite different to what you're aiming for if you're a folk trio um this this advice about sort of genre appropriateness as well and and the costs applies to most of these things so photography is, is another really good case in point um you could spend a heck of a lot on it good photos are really important but you may well have a talented friend um and there are also um, lots of people working within this genre who sort of understand the plight of the independent musician and are sympathetic and will still do an amazing job. Um, the folk community is really special in that respect. I think there's lots of people with lots of different skills and I'm certainly not advocating uh, that you shouldn't pay people. But all I mean is that there are people who um, will understand that you don't have a large budget and uh, will maybe find a way to work within the budget that you do have. So it's worth talking to them about that. Plus, if they understand the genre in which you're working, they, they're likely to have a greater artistic um, sort of uh, sympathy with, with what you're doing and you're more likely to get the results that you want, I think. Um, so something to remember with photography as well is to make sure that they uh, know what you intend to use the photos for and that they're happy for you to have multiple uses on those photos. Um, some photographers license work for a specific purpose, so if you say it's, it's for the album cover, they, they might, that's their understanding, uh, and then they might be a bit disgruntled or think that you're in breach of your agreement if you then go on to use those cover images elsewhere, and you will need to use them elsewhere, you'll need to use them all over online, etc. So just make sure that they're happy with that, possibly you need an agreement um, with mm -hmm. them about that. Uh, graphic design, that's very much the same as above, it can vary hugely. Um, we've worked with a variety of different people, but actually I think one of our least successful graphic design uh, relationships was when we splurged and spent a lot of money with a, with a sort of very swish big company. Actually, we felt that um, the, the relationship was a lot less personal and essentially these people are your artistic collaborators. So I think having that um, good working relationship with them is really important. So we were very much small fry when we worked with that big company and mm -hmm. It was okay what they did, but I really prefer working with um, uh, other independent uh, graphic designers, and uh, I think we've had some really good results that way. Um, we've, there's a lot, you know, toing and froing about the ideas, and um, they've been very involved artistically, and we could afford to work with them without bankrupting yeah. ourselves. So yeah. that's good. Yeah, pressing's quite a big outlay as well. Um, so shop around. Um, it's obviously going to cost you more if you get. Uh, a lower number pressed so maybe press the the largest quantity that you think you can realistically sell um but you want to be aiming for around a pound a unit really unless you're having some kind of fancy cover or something like that yeah uh, a lot more for vinyl obviously yeah um publicity this could also be one of your largest costs so if you are able to employ a publicist it is a big outlay um but it is also a very worthwhile investment we've found um, it can really lift your release and essentially you're putting all this work into making an album um, so you want people to hear it and a, a good publicist, once again genre specific, can, can really help you with that. Um, this is once again, it's only a ballpark figure, different people will be different, um, but if you want to work with someone really good, it could cost you £2,500 £2, a month-ish. Um, and they may well say to you that a three month campaign would be ideal because of course they want that three month lead time. Uh, but uh, financially that does obviously make it a, a very large outlay. Um, for us, we have actually um, uh, often sort of said, I'm afraid we can only have one month and found that still to be very successful. Um, so uh, once again, talk to people, get a feel for, for what they might be able to do with you uh, for you on the budget that you actually have don't um, you know don't bankrupt yourselves um, yeah. um, album publicity is separate from tour publicity um, so um, uh, the album publicity will concentrate on national press interviews and reviews um, you should check with your publicist if they're prepared to do radio for you as well some people hire a separate radio plugger but that obviously is another cost um, so we've always opted for someone who is happy to include radio in the people they're approaching and that's worked well for us. Um, for your tour publicity, that could be a separate uh, publicist again because they would focus less on the national stuff and much more on listings and local, uh, local press, local radio um, and getting the word out about specific gigs. 
Um, but do remember that the venues that you're playing at should probably have publicity teams as well. So it might not be necessary to have a separate tour publicist. Um, various other costs, trying to factor in your videography, content production, marketing, all of these things, they could really rack up. But I think embrace a DIY approach. You can make a lot of content yourselves these days. Um, and uh, consider carefully where you put your marketing budget if you do have one. Ads can be really effective, but don't just sort of splurge money everywhere. I say think carefully mm. about where your audience are. You do get in a review in a magazine and possibly a, an interview or a feature, and that's definitely worth having a, an advert in there as well. If you've got three points of contact in one magazine, yeah, it's more likely to lead to a sale. Mm -hmm. And think about what you want as well, because it's it's quite hard to measure how successful your marketing is if you're just putting sort of random adverts in magazines. But um, if you're if you desperate for more sales, you might notice if you're getting more in after placing an ad. Uh, but possibly it will just be more awareness of your name is is a very valuable thing too. Mm. Um, don't forget the sundries, postage costs, etc. Uh, if you're shipping CDs to distributors, that can be quite expensive. We use a website called My Parcel Delivery to uh, find the cheapest way to ship large quantities of CDs. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot, sound about a pound to send out a CD, but if you're sending 100 to uh, for your publicity drive, then obviously that is a cost that you would want to factor in. Um, and likewise, allow a couple of hundred pounds for printing presses and flyers, especially if you have a long tour, because you'll need lots. Um, and finally, other merchandise. Um, in a world where people are buying CDs less, this can be very effective and uh, well worth the effort. Um, we've done tea towels quite successfully a few times. It costs yeah. about £300 to print 100. Um, and you can add a digital download of the album to a tea towel quite easily. On, yeah. I think one time we printed download codes as stickers and then stick, stuck them on the sleeves of the tea towels and that kind of thing. So that can be yeah. quite effective. Yeah. And finally, just to say crowdfunding, um, as you can see, it's big outlay. So crowdfunding might be an option. Uh, to consider if you're going to struggle with this and we think we've done crowdfunding successfully a couple of times it's a lot of effort and you really need to think about it at the very beginning of your timeline um, but it is also a PR thing so people get very involved with it so it's, it's worth it from a PR point of view as well to increase interest so yeah so uh, we've covered some of this already but you need, to, you need to assemble a team of good people around you you can't do all these jobs yourself and there's a hell of a lot to manage so um, as we said, find a good photographer that's kind of sympathetic to the genre is not going to charge the earth. Graphic designer, similar. Your publicist is a very important relationship, so choose wisely, choose the right one. Someone that under understands the genre, um, it helps if they're into your music, they're going to put more effort in if they're into the music. Um, and you can just feel like you're getting more back. Your recording engineer and producer, this is a really important relationship, choose wisely. Um, we've worked with um, a producer over the years, Mark Tucker, for many years, and it, he's almost become like a member of the band, really. We work really well together. If you get the wrong relationship here, it can be very bad news. Session musicians, you don't overspend on other musicians if you can play loads of instruments. Um, it could be nice to have uh, some featured artists on there, that's up to you. Uh, distributor, we'll cover that later. Um, your booking agent, very important, getting the tour sorted and someone to make videos could be useful as well. Move on. So we're going to go into uh, label services. So this is the stuff that you're going to have to do uh, that a label would otherwise do for you. So uh, there's lots of this. I'm going to whiz through it. First of all, and very importantly, ISRC codes. They are international standard recording codes. You need them before you get your record mastered um, because they need to go into the metadata of the DDP file. And uh, they give your music a unique identity. So it means when you're played on the radio, PRS and PPL, the royalty collection societies will know you've been played um, and so then you will get paid. Uh, so the way to get ISRC codes without a label is that you will need to acquire your own unique STEM code from PPL. There's information about how to do that on their website. Um, that you then identify each track using your stem. So our stem is UK2SC, and then we add the year and number of tracks. So the first track we record this year will be called UK2SC 21 um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, you also might want a catalogue number. That's something we've been asked for before by distributors. So we called our, our record label Dragonfly Roots, 
And then when we make a product, we label it accordingly. So it's DR, and then if it's a CD, so it'd be DRCD004 is the, is the number of the, the CD album version of our album, Edge Larks. You also might want a barcode if you're getting distributed. Um, so uh, you can buy them for various online providers, or sometimes your printer can provide that, so ask them and make sure you tell the graphic designer as well so they leave a space for it. You should register all your tracks with PRS, the Performing Rights Society, so then you get your royalties as a songwriter. You should also register with PPL. Um, when you're recording, keep track of all the session musicians that you use, who plays what on what track, and then register your album with PPL. Um, in order to keep track of that stuff, there's an agreement form on the Musicians Union website called the M4 form, which is quite useful. The MCPS, Mechanical Copyright Protection Society, this is very much not our area of expertise. It's an area where we have uh, made many mistakes and I still find it very confusing. But basically, um, you, um, you will either need an MCPS license or an MCPS license exclusion. Um, and you can get an exclusion if you're an MCPS member and you release your own work through your own record company. Um, but we do find this an area that's hard to navigate. We recently received an invoice for an album we made years ago. We couldn't figure out why we'd had it. And then we finally realised it was actually Phil claiming against the duo. <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't mean to. <laughs> so we, we had to pay MCPS so they could pay me minus <laughs> the admin fee. Yes, so don't do that. Pressing. Yeah, so I think we've covered this really. Um, you're going to have to, yeah, you're going to have to find a, a pressing plant that you want to work with, find out the time scale, find out exactly what they want from you. We use Accent Media, they're excellent. We've also used Sound Performance in the past, they're also great. There are many, just Google it. And then these final two, um, distribution and publicity, they're really big areas, so we're going to go into them in a bit more depth. Yeah, distribution, uh, very important, getting your music out there into the shops in front of people. Um, so there's physical distribution, that's uh, getting your CDs into the shops, onto the, into the online retailers, so on. And we've always distributed through uh, Proper Distribution, who are the biggest distributor for this genre in this country. And so we send them a, a portion of what we get pressed, and then they then distribute those to the record shops and the online retailers like Amazon and so on. And then digital distribution is separate for us. Um, we, uh, we, we do ours through a French publishing company called Absaloni, who we actually formed a relationship with through English Folk Expo. So that was nice. Um, but there are many sites like CD Baby where you can set up um, yourself for um, your digital distribution. Um, now, I'll just touch briefly on the sort of the great streaming debate here, because I feel like it's important to say something, although it's a whole other lecture in itself. But um, we feel that you should consider your strategy carefully before releasing um, your music through digital streaming platforms. Obviously, it is the way it's done these days. It's how people might discover you. It, it does have its benefits, but um, we do feel that you should expect something in return for your hard work. And as we all know, financial returns um, for streaming are pitiful. So we feel that the way to sort of uh, approach it is that streaming uh, should become a funnel for you, like a marketing funnel. Um, or either you're, you're aiming to direct fans to come to your shows or to buy things on your Bandcamp site or join your mailing list. You know, you get something back in return for people listening to your music in that way. Um, so, you know, perhaps you could consider only releasing part of your catalogue on streaming service um, or drive listeners towards a subscription service like Patreon or we have a Bandcamp. Um, either way, with streaming, whether you're really going to do it for this release or not, you should claim your profiles. Um, on all of the platforms, Spotify, iTunes, Apple, Amazon, YouTube, Deezer, Pandora. Um, you need music up on them in order to claim your profile. So if this album is your first release, um, uh, you should put something else up first, like a single, so then you can get set up properly for the big release. Mm, top tip. <laughs> um, well, alongside these more kind of conventional distribution methods, we've, right from the word go, been running um, a more kind of direct to fan independent stream um, distribution method through Bandcamp, which is a great site, um, which it allows us to communicate directly with our fans and they, they order through Bandcamp and we send the CDs to them ourselves. And it actually forms the basis of our shop on our website as well. So we, we found that um, a useful uh, tool over the years. Um, I think the, um 
the director fan relationship for us it seems like the future of the music industry um, and a site like Bandcamp really allows us to um, uh, to work with that really well because um, when people buy something through our Bandcamp um, they um, with their permission of course um, get signed up to the to the mailing list option there they get notified next time we do a release so it builds community around what we're doing um, and then actually we do have a, a subscription option as well on our Bandcamp site um, which has proved really popular um, so yes that's that's the way we see things going and obviously that direct fan model you know it covers both physical and digital so we feel it's really successful so let's talk about how to approach publicity when you're doing it all yourself <laughs> this is a really big area and i think maybe one of the most difficult for indie musicians um, to do effectively um, but if you've made a beautiful record you really need to work out how to get people to listen to it so um, if you have the budget to hire a publicist, that's fantastic. It can give you an edge in getting your record heard, but we feel that if you haven't got a budget, it's okay. There is actually loads you can still do. So the first thing I think everyone needs to do when they're making a record is work out what your story is. Give people a, a memorable angle that they can relate to, um, preferably something that stands a chance of drawing them in, even if they've never heard your music. So you want that this catchy story. For instance, Steve Knightley gave us a good one when we were first starting out. He um he told us he told everyone that um he'd discovered us busking on Sidmouth seafront, uh, which was absolutely true. He, he did, but he did also see us perform on the main stage of a major festival uh, the week before that. Um, however, we leave that bit out because it doesn't add to the story. There's this lovely romantic story of these sort of rambling troubadours busking on the seafront, rags to riches. Um, sort of rich. <laughs> you know what I mean. It was it was very effective, and it, it painted a picture of um, of the music we were, we were making. I think quite effectively. Yeah. Or um, another example would be the the last album we made. We made it during the first lockdown uh, last year, so we had to make we had to do all the recording from home, and we kind of made that a feature and a kind of the story of the album. Um, yeah, so that was uh, that was kind of linking in this idea that um, we we were obviously forced to just do it all ourselves um, because of the lockdown, um, and there was this real sense of sort of peril in the music industry, which I don't think has gone away, um, and um, sort of a sense of struggling. But everyone was struggling, and we chose to record. Um, it was entirely traditional songs, and so we kind of picked out this idea of these traditional songs. Are themselves these mighty survivors they have weathered hundreds of years and all these crazy you know things in history that that somehow they've survived through and come down to us through the years and it, it gave us a sense of, of hopefulness and that's what we tried to imbue the album with and that became the kind of focus for everything that we told people about what we were trying to do with the album so once you've got this story um you need to kind of weave it in to your brand identity really um, tie everything in so your visuals once you've got your visuals make sure that everything is uh, is reskinned to to match your album cover website socials your posters make sure it's all really consistent down to the colors and fonts that you use um, a graphic designer is it can often really help with that ask them to make you a kind of branding kit um, and then of course um, you will have um, saved up your material when you were recording you've got your, your video snippets and your outtakes etc um, so then you can plan your social media campaign and you can use um, those previously gathered um, uh, assets to, to create a really effective social media campaign. Use a smart link. Uh, we use Linktree, but there's many. Linkfire is another one. Um, what a smart link is, is rather than posting a, a, a post on Facebook with 12 links to all the different places that people can hear your music, um, the algorithm will just kind of go near and not show that to anybody. Um, so instead, you can compress that into one link using a smart link, um, and um, it, then that will direct people. People click on the smart link, and then they will see all the options looking looking attractive and pretty of where they could go to, to pre-order and pre-save um, your music. Um, so the pre-orders, uh, as I've mentioned, we use Bandcamp. They're good. They help you generate momentum. They give you some money. Uh, up front, which can be really useful because you've probably got quite a collection of bills by now. But they are also a kind of useful publicity stunt, so you can you can um, get people feeling pretty enthusiastic about that. I think it's, it's a good call to action to keep repeating the same thing. You know, here's where you pre-order or pre-save. So directing people um, who might be interested. Um, if 
you have a budget, choose your ads carefully, I've already mentioned that, and bear in mind that you could spend that money on social media campaigns as well. Try and find out where your audience are, that's the most valuable thing. I think for the folk world it's quite um, well known that Facebook is the is the is probably the key one. Um, if you don't have a publicist, write your own press release. Uh, there's many guides to how to do that effectively online, but obviously you're just you're trying to tell this story. So you've got your biography written in keeping with the album and um, you, you wanna base it around that, tell them what they need to know about the album as well. Um, and make sure that you have an EPK, an electronic press kit. So this could be a, a page on your website. You probably want to make it password protected. Um, and you're going to include uh, your biography updated around the story of your release and you should have a long version and a short version of that to make uh, people's jobs a bit easier. You want some media quotes, high-res images that people can download, um, downloadable and also streamable files of the music you're trying to get them to listen to, so depending how they're listening it gives them options, try and make it as easy as possible for them. Um, hopefully a music video for, for a key track a downloadable PDF of the press release as well. And of course, it should all be really well presented and consistent with your branding. Um, so uh, you should also um, maintain uh, and keep updating your own database of potential media contacts. So this can cover everything from radio to online to print press. Um, once you've got your press release and EPK, you can start sending it out to people. And something that I have done is on that database, um, keep track of, of when you send something to somebody so that you can see if, if they've replied and if they haven't, you can follow it up and know that you haven't sort of just um, kept haranguing them. You, you want to be gentle and polite um, so um, you don't irritate people. And also do try and make sure that um, those contacts on that database are relevant. Um, don't harass someone who is really into death metal with your folk trio. If it's, you know, if, if it's not their kind of thing, don't waste your time or theirs. Um, and, and try and um, reinforce it if you, um, if you have some kind of contact with them uh, previously, you know, you were kind enough to um, play my previous release, make it personal, don't just blanket email lots of people, write an individual message to each person and um, you'll definitely get a better response that way. And also I'm, I'm saying, you know, be polite and, and be gentle, but you don't have to be overly cautious because the worst thing that can happen is they don't reply and many people won't reply, but do have a stab uh, at sending your music to someone you really admire. Um, because I think that heartfeltness comes across and it is something we've had success with in the past, which was absolutely gratifying. Um, so um, in an ideal world, your campaign will be underway. You might do singles. Obviously, think, uh, physical singles aren't a thing anymore, but you might release them digitally um, with, with corresponding music videos. And that would be a really good way to, to build momentum ahead of your album release. Um, on streaming services, releasing music frequently, so little and often, is, is preferable, actually, than, than just doing one big release every couple of years, uh, because it keeps uh, it means that you keep popping up um, in, the, in, the, in their algorithm for people to listen to new stuff. Um, and as a quick aside, always pitch your music to Spotify when you're releasing anything through them. Um, because although it's unlikely that you'll end up on a big playlist, um, as long as you pitch, it ensures that you end up on the release radar playlist of everyone who already follows you. So that's well worth doing. Also, you could create playlists on um, streaming services around your new music saying, oh, this is a playlist of inspiration for this record or, you know, Phil might create one that was a Dobro playlist or something and that gives you something else to put out there on social media that's not quite so sort of um, insular you know it's reaching out making connections with other people people respond to that very well I think if you're not just going on and on about yourself all the time. Um, music videos we've touched on they are important um, you can use live footage lyric videos you know embrace that DIY thing because they are very expensive to get made. Even phone videos are, yeah. are worth doing. Yeah exactly. So valuable. Exactly. Um, it's an area, to be honest, that we have struggled um, to, to find a sort of effective uh, way to get right. Uh, if you're looking for inspiration, there are loads of great artists doing very clever, kind of simple but beautiful ideas. And one that I'd really recommend you go and look up is our friend The Little Unsaid on YouTube. He's got some great videos, um, one in particular where he walked around his part of London with the song that the video is for playing in headphones and he approached total strangers and got chatting and got them to listen in the headphones and then the video is just them all responding to the music so some people danced some people painted some people um uh, kind of juggled loads of stuff it's, it's a joy so look that up 
basically get creative um there's lots that you can do in our online world drive traffic to your website by blogging create a podcast talking through inspirations or um, interview people other you know contemporary artists um about their processes collaborate network it's always good go live on facebook youtube do an online launch um and um finally you will get to release day and when you've got there remember that that is actually only the beginning um it's but most people won't have heard your album yet so don't feel that you have to stop talking about it keep going keep that momentum going um a tour um will help with that um you know invite your mailing list to a listening party keep keep up the energy reviews start coming in which helps to keep the fire burning doesn't it yeah exactly so you you have to remember that although you might feel a bit sick of your album by now um this is just the beginning so keep going and very best of luck with it all and i i've whizzed through a lot of information there so we have produced a checklist which um i think you'll be able to get after the event as well so here's a list of all the things it's not an exhaustive list um Mm -hmm. that you might want to do so thanks very much for listening and um i think we'll see if there's any questions now wow um thank you very much both uh i'll just here we go that thank you there was so much in that i'm gonna have to watch that (laughs) watch that back again and with with my notepad um amazing it doesn't have show how much in how massive amount the workload is to to release an album like that i mean it really is a big project to to undertake so uh wow thank you for highlighting that we've got quite a few questions i'm going to start at the top work my way down and we'll see how many we get through if that's okay our best (laughs) um can you tell us more about your digital distributor how did you decide who to go with you mentioned absolone but you've also mentioned cd baby and some others do you have any advice for anyone looking to to, to find a digital, a digital distributor? I, I don't feel that it's our area of expertise, but the reason that we like Absalone is um, he has, the, the, the main chap that we know, Fabrice, Fabrice has yeah. a very um, forward thinking way, um, a very sympathetic to artist way of approaching it all. So he's very keen um, that, that musicians should be able to make a living and he sees the inequities in the, in the current streaming model and he tries to help us find ways to get around that. He's not a fan of Spotify and the rest of them, but he sees that inevitably we have to learn how to work with them and how to get back something from them. And yeah, he's he's given us some really good ideas on that front. So yeah, we're we're happy with him in that respect. And we've never actually used CD Baby, I should say that either no. as well. So it sounds good to me. They have a, a podcast, or it might be Van Zugel, but they work mm. together to yeah. have a podcast called the DIY Musician Podcast. There's lots of good information on there. Um, and it sounds like a good thing, but I have never actually used it. Mm-hmm. There we go. Thank you for that. Um, uh, okay, next. You mentioned potentially not doing uh, tour PR and leaving it to the venue. Do you find that the venue has expectations that the artist will do a certain level of promotion themselves? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think, I mean, we all want to make the gig a success, so we have to assume we're all on the same team with that, I think. Um we do have booking agents, so they potentially act as a bit of a buffer, although obviously they would nudge us if they didn't think we were promoting the gigs. So I would I would expect that I would make sure that the information about the gigs was up across all of my online presence, that I would tell my mailing list, that I would do, I'd say maybe only as much as one social media post in advance per gig. You know, if you're, if you're doing a tour of 30 gigs, then promising much more than that is, is quite hard. And I don't think venues have have had a problem with that i think it's generally well we do we often do pay for the tour pr as well and it's not as it's nowhere near as big an outlay as um album pr kind of national pr is there are some very affordable uh, companies that can offer you um maybe you're like 30 pound a gig or something you and it, it could be well worth doing get you in all the local listings and it's only a couple of tickets extra that have three to... three bombs on seats or whatever and you've covered that so it could well be worth doing yeah I think that's a really good way to think about it. I'm also like the fact that people talk about self-releasing albums and uh, come across it as DIY, but it's quite clear from from your presentation, it's definitely anything other than DIY. Actually, you've got a whole team of people in there all working together that you're project managing to to deliver this that that outcome. Um, uh, the next question I have on here is: uh, Is it true that shops and Amazon won't accept albums without a barcode and catalogue number? Hmm. 
I would have thought that it might be true, but I actually don't know for sure because we've always put a barcode and catalogue number. <laughs> and I think I think that's probably why. Like, um, so we've never dealt directly with the shops or Amazon. I don't think a shop could use a CD without a barcode on. They wouldn't. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I sit with their tills and, and what yeah. have you. So it, it, it's got to be there, really. I'm not sure if the catalogue number is quite as critical as the barcode, but I think it's important because it's it's information that the distributor has always asked us for, yeah. and they're the people putting the CDs into the shops so from from uh, from English Flag Expo's point of view um, as you'll know we recently launched or relatively recently launched the official folk albums chart and so I got sort of stuck into that kind of side of it and uh, I'm I think I was surprised to find out how important making sure that your full registrations with PPL to get all your ISRCs and fully inputting all of that seems to me absolutely essential if you want to maximize the opportunity for the album in any in any field yeah um Next one I've got here. Um, if you do a cover on your album, or you might not know this, you mentioned about MCPS. If you do a cover on your album, can you still get an MCPS license exclusion? I don't think so, but from memory, and this is like, do check this information. So we did an album where there was one cover and like 10 other songs. And so I think you, you do only pay for the one song that you're, mm. that's a cover. Yeah, the others are So they, they do it by proportion mm. of, of, of stuff on the album. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're rattling through a couple more questions here. How do you balance uh, the? Uh, you can hear it's a uh, end of school time here, so my house is yeah. filling up with shouting children. Um, how how do you balance the fact that uh, promoters check Spotify figures, or promoters might check your Spotify figures, um, given that you've you've spoken about a reduced catalog? Do you kind of write about that anywhere on your website? Is that a consideration? No, honestly, I'd never thought about it actually, but. To be fair, it's kept to 22, isn't it? It is, and I think we're in a, a kind of privileged position in that we were doing this before streaming was really a thing. So I think we've probably built relationships with a lot of the promoters that we'd be other people might be approaching cold, and 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 the promoter might look at their Spotify figures. But it's not as we as we were quite honest about. It's not an area we've put all our efforts into because it mm. it just doesn't seem to to work for us particularly well. So. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a balancing act, really. It is. Um, it is. I mean, there is, you know, some kind of uh, awareness to be gained. If you know, you need to make sure that your presence on streaming services is good. I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and to what extent would you say if we're if you're balancing it out, you've got you mentioned you use proper as your physical distribution. Mm -hmm. How does that work as a percentage in terms of your physical sales between physical uh, using proper or physical distribution? the direct to fan model that you do and then merch sales at gigs what's the kind of split in terms of the, the the total number that you press well i would think that in normal times in the before times uh mm. sales at gigs are are our largest area but since we have been building the band camp community which we kind of tie in with our mailing list and everything um that's where our core fans are so usually if we're releasing an album we tell them in advance and i'd say a heck of a lot of people on our mailing list would, would now order it direct from us in advance. So that might even be coming up to, to, to level with the sales at gigs now, uh, as witnessed by the, the album that we made during lockdown and obviously people could only get it remotely and um, we sold a lot of them. So Yeah, we've sent um, upwards of a thousand copies to proper at the, at the start before, it, but as things have, you know, kind of deteriorated physical sales-wise over the years, we're sending them more like, 500 or maybe slightly less at the start now aren't we and, and so then it kind of ticks over and, so we keep sending them so the, and the, if they need more they ask yeah. for them and we send them more so and the, mm. that physical distribution so into shops and etc it is worth doing for us we do periodically get money <laughs> um but obviously all the cuts are taken out as well so um in terms of actual numbers it's it is the smallest um proportion for sure Mm -hmm. but well be, yeah. not not mm. like probably not dramatically so yeah it's nice to see the cd in hmb though does hmb still exist yes <laughs> it's nice to go looking for the cd in hmb yeah that's a nice moment i can imagine yeah. um, and, and, but also uh, people like um those online physical distributors like proper also have their own websites where they could sell your cd so you know that's, a, that's yeah. a, another outlet um, and similarly um you spoke quite a bit about pre-sales pre-saves what would you say is there a kind of a regular split between the amount of albums that you would expect to sell in the pre-sale period versus once you've had the release 
once again it's quite hard to say especially because of the strange year we've had and the the most recent album that we've made being a lockdown album so that um i'd say with the album before that we sold we, we do sell quite a lot of pre-orders and i think this is because of this idea of community so i think we have got this real strong core fan base who really want to support us and obviously pre-orders are useful to to clear all the bills from making the album and mm. i think they know that so we do well on pre-orders but then i think after after the release date um we would probably be expecting to mainly sell cds at gigs wouldn't we like on the launch tour which I probably so, balances yeah. it out maybe a trickle coming through on through Bandcamp and the, and the reviews can cause a spike in sales again and that kind of thing with a good yes. review comes through and what have you. Mm. Mm. I think a, a couple more questions if that's right uh, that will try and squeeze into the final f final few minutes there's a question here in the chat about sending out review copies of CDs do you yeah. do that do you do that yourselves how many do you send out so um, it, it very much varies. So we've been lucky enough to work with some really great publicists in the past. I've worked with John Crosby, we've worked with Jane Brace. They're, they're all absolutely lovely. I think Jane tends to ask for 250, 250 CDs. Mm. So she sends out a lot. Um, and then with this last album, the lockdown album, so we did do it totally DIY. That was kind of the whole point. And we probably sent out maybe a hundred um, for, for publicity uh, but it's really important to note that um, a lot of the time publications will tell you on their website how they want to receive approaches so don't just blanketly send them I saw um, uh, Tom Robinson uh, when he was doing his BBC Six show uh, sort of having a bit of an online rant because lots of people were still sending CDs in during lockdown he was saying there's nobody there you're just wasting your effort and your money and your, your CD um, whereas uh, quite a lot of publications in the folk world still like a physical cd so do send that and put a print out a copy of your press release and you know send that but some people prefer the electronic mm -hmm. route so just try and do your research on that front yeah that makes a lot of sense um another question i've just noticed in the in the q a here geek question alert that says do you master separately for download versions versus the cd versions never have done no um it's the same master uh, it would be a separate master for vinyl, but um, we're not having we're not getting a separate master for digital and physical. Mm -hmm. And the final question for me, it's probably the the elephant in the room. There, it's a massive outlay that you put into those albums. Presumably, there must be the return must be uh, significant enough for, you, for, you, for it to work out for you. Or or do you normally do that through crowdfunding? Is it that you've had to invest your own money and you hope to make a return that's well beyond? The amount you've invested or is it that you've raised the money elsewhere or, or from your fans or, or whatever that might be yeah, we've always made a profit from the albums we've made um and i think from conversations with, with fellow artists in terms of this choice between a label and self-releasing we know that we make substantially more money <laughs> like yeah. you know we have made our living doing this for the last 10 years and we've bought a house and we we yeah. do okay when you recoup your costs and if you're buying CD for a pound and selling it for 10 or 12 pound 50, the profit margin is actually really good. Um, but all, the CD doesn't, or the albums, should I say, doesn't just represent um, financial return. It's also your kind of reason to be doing music again. You've got new material. It kind of rejuvenates the project mm. on a two yearly cycle. So you're yeah. not just playing the same songs again and again and again. So it has that purpose it gives you a reason to do a big tour and people come out especially and you maybe sell more tickets and it all kind of ties in and, and comes together generally yeah so so you do you do i guess stand a bit of a risk um doing the outlay but for us it's definitely worked a, a, in a cumulative way so we started yeah. out um doing our own recordings 10 years ago in quite quite a basic fashion mm. and um so and now we're back to doing that again yeah we are <laughs> but we, we've got better equipment now we can do it a lot better can't we so yeah. and better knowledge um but we kind of gradually built it up so we didn't like risk uh kind of putting all our eggs in one basket and then not selling enough of the album to recoup it's much more of a gradual evolution of, of the project um we've so. been lucky in um, getting some nice gigs some support a support tour with show of hands we sold a lot of units on that we sold a lot of units supporting seth lateman and if you've got the right gigs and yeah. have, having physical product there can be really 
worthwhile and the festivals as well you can tell a lot of festivals are the golden days aren't fully over yet there's still there's still <laughs> money to be made yeah Absolutely. Uh, well, I just want to say thank you once again. I think it, one of the things you really, that's really stuck with me is how personal that connection is with your fans on that director fan situation, that idea that they might support you on Bandcamp, that you might develop, build that relationship fan by fan to sustain yeah. the career. I really like that, that organic approach. I think that's fantastic. But, um, but Edge Larks, Phil, Hannah, thank you so much for talking to us today. This talk will be available in the next couple of days on folktalkacademy.com and we'll see you all soon. Thank you. Bye.